Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about lookup tables. What is a lookup table and why do we use it? Well, a lookup table is a classic example of trading memory for computation speed. Okay? Memory you're going to chew up some memory so you can make things faster. There's a couple of really good examples of where you might use this. Uh, number one would be for error correction or linearization for something like a sensor. You know, sensors are not perfect. You would like them to be, but uh, no such luck. Another good example of use would be a wavetable. Matter of fact, at the end of the lab manual, the accompanying lab manual, there is a uh, an exercise using a wavetable to create arbitrary wave shapes, a direct digital synthesis, simple example of a direct digital synth uh, synthesis wave waveform generator. Okay, so let's take a look, uh, number one, at our, our first problem with a sensor. So I'm going to make a little sort of idealized map out here for our sensor. Let's say we have a temperature sensor. So here's our temperature. And over here is the output value of the sensor. Now, ideally, we're going to get a perfect straight line out of this thing. In other words, something that looks like that. Okay. Now, just to keep things simple. Let's say that we have uh, an 8-bit sensor, so it's a, uh, an unsigned character, a single byte. So that's going to be values from 0 to 255, all right? So we're just going to say this is 8 bits. So it varies from 0 to 255. Right, a single unsigned character. And just to keep things on the simple side, let's say that uh, one millivolt of temperature change turns into one Fahrenheit degree. So if I uh, measure out of here, you know, 25 millivolts, then I know it's 25 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's sort of the, the idealization. The reality is not so convenient you might get something that looks like this in the real world. Now, what is this telling you? Well, just to grab a number, let's say we had um, 100 degrees out here. So what I would expect in my perfect sensor is to get 100 millivolts. However, with my not-so-ideal sensor, we find that instead we get a higher value in this case, right? Let's just say for argument's sake, it's 110 millivolts. Now you might think, okay, I, I'll just add 10 millivolts. Well, you know, that's not going to work. I mean, it's going to work at this one temperature, but it's not going to work down here where the values are pretty close. It's not going to work right here. I mean, maybe this is 200 degrees and we get exactly 200 millivolts. Right? So a simple scaling or an offset isn't going to work. As a matter of fact, if I go to a higher temperature, if I'm up here at like, you know, 230 degrees, we can see we're actually on the low side. You know, instead of getting 230 millivolts, we're going to get, uh, you know, 215 or 220 or something like that. So not so good, right? 100 degrees does not get us 100 millivolts. It gets us 110 millivolts. All right, so how do we correct this issue? Well, you know, this is a form of distortion in a way. It's, it's um, you know, a nonlinearity that we can correct through an inverse relationship. So what I'm going to say is on this side, right, on my horizontal, this is going to be my sensor value. In other words, the value I pulled out over here. And then this is going to be a corrected result. In other words, a, a true temperature. 
right, the corrected result. So again, if this was a perfectly linear thing, we would have this nice straight line. But in fact, what we're going to do is make sort of an inverse of this, right, where this goes uh, a little bit steeper and then flattens out. Um, we're going to have this thing start slower and then speed up. You know, and if this was that 200 degrees, again, that's, that's basically where it's going to cross. So we're going to get something that goes like that. So whatever these deviations are, we get the same deviations over here. Okay, so getting back to my uh, 110 millivolts that I threw in here, you know, if this was, a, again, a perfectly linear result, we'd get our 110. But instead, because I have this curve that's sort of dipping down, we adjust this so that we get 100. All right, and then back over here, you know, at 200, 200, um, <clears throat> when we had 200 back here, when it got 200 out, 200 in here would give me 200 out. And over here where I had, you know, 230 in and it got me, um, you know, 210 or something like that, then a 210 over here, Right, would be coming out on the high side, and I would get my 230 again. So if I do this right, if I make this mirror image, the green version, a nice mirror image of the red version, then this thing becomes linearized. All right, so you know that sounds good in theory, but how do we actually do that? Um, oh, before I go any further, I should indicate that we can actually go a step beyond this. Um, instead of just having this one-to-one -one matching, we can actually include on the output end other scaling and mapping functions. As a matter of fact, we can even change the kind of variable. I could have, um, as I said, an 8-bit value on the input end over here and have uh, maybe a short integer or a floating point value on the output end. I can do all kinds of really cool things with this, all right? But keeping it simple, right? Keeping it 8-bit, 8-bit. Um, how do we do this? How do we implement it? Well, essentially all you do is you create an array and every element in the array corresponds in this case to the green set of values where the index is the sensor value right so i put in um, a temperature of 100 degrees i get out this numeric value um, from my digital analog uh, excuse me my uh, analog to digital converter i get out the value 110 Right, representing 110 millivolts. So that 110 becomes an index into this array. And, and then I pull out the appropriate value. In this case, I pull out 100, which in this case represents 100 millivolts. So that's all I have to do is just make a big array, right? The end result, code-wise, you know, would look something like, let's say I have a function, uh, I'll just call it read sensor. All right, so this goes out and reads the temperature sensor, and I get some value x, right? So x is an un unsigned uh, character. So like I said, that's the, uh, the number 110 in my example. x becomes an index into the, into the uh, correction array, into the lookup table. In other words, my actual temperature would be, I'll just call it table, index x. That's it. So my table, because this is an 8-bit value and has 256 possible entries, my table has 256 entries, one for every individual temperature. Okay? Ideally, you know, you'd, you, you could measure every single temperature, but in reality, you would probably um, skip through this and you could do a little uh, curve match on that in a little curve fit. But whatever. So this is very quick. In other words, you, gr you grab the sensor value, you get a numeric value, you use that as an index into your array, and the array essentially corrects this for you. All right? Very fast. All right? Memory versus speed. Very, very fast to do this. Um, the cost is the memory for the table. All right? So if I kept this as an 8-bit, well, that's going to be 256 bytes. Okay? On a controller, you know, 256-byte uh, array is not, you know, a horrible thing. Um, you know, we're used to thinking of huge memory on desktop computers, but remember, you know, on a, on a microcontroller, the memory footprint is definitely constrained. But still, that's not very much. And like I said, you could have 
uh, a larger array that contains floats or shorts or something like that. Okay, so that's the basic way this works. Um, if you were going to do this in a digital form, you can do the same kind of thing in the analog world with um, a function synthesis circuit, like with an op amp. Okay, you could control the gain characteristic, make this sort of green increasing gain characteristic. All right, second one, wavetable. Suppose you want to create a sine wave. I'm just going to start with a sine wave, but this could be any old waveform. So again, you, you could use an analog solution. You could create an op amp circuit or something like that, transistor circuit to you know generate a specific sine wave. But we can do something called direct digital synthesis. This is how modern function generators work. Essentially what we do is uh, we sort of sample this thing. In other words, we create measurement values. In other words, you know what each individual value is in time, right? So we just turn these into numbers. In this case, I'm going to keep with the idea of 8-bit values. Okay. So I have a bunch of 8-bit values here that represent my waveform, right? This is pulse-coded modulation. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll take these values and I'll send them out through a port. And then we'll use a, a digital to analog converter to recreate our sine wave or you know, whatever wave it is. Now, the other way to do this without, without using some kind of a table would be to directly compute these values. In other words, the output value, the thing that you're going to send out to the port, uh, I'll just call it V for value, um, would be something like this. You'd have some uh, peak value times the sine of you know, 2 pi ft where F is the frequency and T is the, the time interval, right? Where, where along are you? Well, this is computationally expensive, trying to calculate the sign for this. You're going to have to use floating point numbers. Man, this is going to be really, really pokey. So instead, what we do is, once again, we create a table, and the table will be, con will be filled with these individual values. In other words, it's pre-computed, okay? So... In the case of a sine wave, we could actually make this a little bit more efficient because a sine wave has quarter wave symmetry. We could really just fill a table for one quarter of this, and then we could either do a, um, a horizontal or vertical sort of flip to get the other three quarters, right? The other three quadrants, right? So if I take this and I flop it around the vertical axis, right, I get this piece. And then if I take either of those pieces and I flip them around the uh, horizontal axis, I can get this piece, right? But... You know, that's just a sort of a refinement, but the basic idea is we pre-compute the values. So now I can just go through a little loop, grab a value from the table, send it out the port, right? Send it to the uh, digital analog converter, get the next one, just keep doing this in a loop. And then when we get to the end of it, we just re-index the table back to the top and we keep on going. As a matter of fact, there's a nice little trick you can do here where um, using a table, if you did... Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll call it wavetable. You could have an index in here, uh, i, okay, and you could just increment i, like so. So this is the value that's going to go out to your port. If i is an unsigned character, in other words, an 8-bit value, when it gets up to 255, incrementing it, will overflow and it'll go back to zero. You won't, you won't even have to um, you know, tech, check to see if it's, if, if it's reached its limit. You could just keep incrementing this thing and it automatically would flip back to zero when it hits the end, okay? That's kind of a handy little thing. That would work well with what's called a, um, a variable sample rate. In other words, I just speed up and slow down the rate at which I send these values out in my loop um, to change the frequency, right? There's pluses and minuses to doing that. It's an easy implementation, but it's, it's uh, a little bit more of a challenge to filter the output properly. So typically what we would do uh, in a higher quality uh, synthesizer would be to um, interpolate into the table and we would keep the sample rate constant. And, uh, you know, if we came up with an instant in time that was, you know, here, well, I have two adjacent points. 
as long as the table is filled with a sufficient number of things, we could do a quick interpolation there and get a true value. So I would just sort of skip through this thing repeatedly. It's a little bit more overhead, but there are, like I said, certain advantages to doing that. And here's one really cool thing. You can have an arbitrary wave. You're not stuck with sine waves. You could, and you're not even stuck with triangles and squares. You could do all kinds of weird stuff. You know, you could, um, maybe you're, you're trying to check something to see how it handles, um, you know, noise or, or, or spike or something like that. So you could have a waveform that's, you know, sort of a sine wave, but has a, you know, nasty like spike in it like this, you know, um, you know, how do you, how do you generate that with an, an analog circuit? Well, that's a little bit of a challenge here. All you have to do is just, um, you know, figure out what you want. You know, you do your computations for the waveform. Um, and, and that's what you use for your, uh, your, your wave table. Okay. And you just run through that over and over and over and you can get some, you know, weird sort of, of, uh, wave shape out of this. All right. Okay. There are some other uses for lookup tables. Um, but. These are two really good examples of where you might use it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of a common technique, like I said, for error corrector, uh, correction and linearization of, uh, sensors and something like this, uh, wavetable generation. All right. Goody, goody.